Macbeth by William Shakespeare Read by the AI-created voice of Patrick Stewart for the Audioverse Shakespeare Unleashed series Part 1 Prophecy and Ambition On a desolate heath in medieval Scotland, where mist clings to the heather and thunder rolls across black skies, three figures meet in the gathering darkness. These are the weird sisters, witches whose prophecies will set in motion events that will shake the Scottish throne to its foundations. Lightning illuminates their grotesque forms as they speak of meeting again, when the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. The battle they speak of rages nearby, where King Duncan's forces clash with rebel armies and Norwegian invaders. In the thick of this combat, a warrior proves himself exceptional through his courage and ferocity. This is Macbeth, Thane of Glamis, his sword running red with the blood of Scotland's enemies. Fighting beside him is Banquo, his trusted friend and fellow general, their combined might turning the tide of battle in Duncan's favour. As the fighting winds down and victory is secured, Macbeth and Banquo make their way across the same blasted heath where the witches gathered. The air is thick with an unnatural fog, and the sounds of battle fade to an eerie silence. Suddenly the weird sisters appear before them, ancient, terrible figures that seem neither wholly male nor female, neither fully of earth nor air. Their prophecies strike like lightning bolts into Macbeth's soul. To him they bow and speak, Hail, Macbeth! Hail to thee, Thane of Glamis! Hail to thee, Thane of Cawdor! All hail, Macbeth! Thou shalt be king hereafter. To Banquo they speak words both promising and ominous. His children shall be kings, though he shall be none. Before either warrior can question these strange pronouncements, the witches vanish into the mist, leaving behind only the echoes of their cackling laughter and the seed of ambition planted in Macbeth's heart. Banquo observes his friend's reaction with growing concern, noting how he starts and seems to fear things that sound so fair. Their contemplation of this supernatural encounter is interrupted by the arrival of Ross and Angus, nobles bearing news from the king. Duncan, in gratitude for Macbeth's victory, has indeed named him Thane of Cawdor, the previous holder of that title being a traitor sentenced to death. This immediate fulfilment of part of the witch's prophecy sends Macbeth's thoughts racing toward the greater prize they promised. In a letter to his wife, Lady Macbeth, he relates these events. As she reads his words in the great hall of their castle at Inverness, her own ambition ignites like one, wildfire. Glamis thou art and Cawdor, and shalt be what thou art promised, she declares. But she fears her husband's nature, too full of the milk of human kindness, to take the shortest path to greatness. When news arrives that King Duncan plans to honour them with a visit to their castle, Lady Macbeth sees opportunity take shape. Standing alone in the gathering darkness, she makes a chilling invocation. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here, and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Her prayer for darkness is answered as night falls over Inverness Castle. Duncan arrives with his retinue, including his sons Malcolm and Donalbane, as well as Banquo and other nobles. The king is impressed by the castle's pleasant aspect, unknowing that within its walls conspiracy and murder are taking shape. Lady Macbeth greets him with a show of perfect hospitality, her gentle appearance masking the deadly purpose in her heart. Part 2. The Deed and Its Shadow as night deepens over Inverness Castle, Macbeth stands alone in the courtyard, his mind wrestling with the deed his wife has proposed. The air is thick with an unseasonable heat, and no stars pierce the clouded sky. In this darkness, he contemplates the murder of his king, a man who has just honoured him, who trusts him, who sleeps now under the supposed safety of his roof. If it were done when it is done, he muses, then twere well it were done quickly. But the consequences of such an act spiral endlessly in his imagination. Duncan is not only his king, but his cousin, his guest, and a widely beloved ruler. Success in this venture might secure the crown, but could easily damn his soul. 
Lady Macbeth finds him in this state of indecision. Her words cut through his hesitation like a knife through silk. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since? She challenges his manhood, his courage, his very nature, wielding shame and ambition as weapons to drive him toward murder. When he protests that they might fail, her response reveals the full measure of her determination. Screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. Her plan is methodical. She has already plied Duncan's guards with wine and food, ensuring they will sleep deeply. When all others are abed, Macbeth will enter the king's chamber and do the deed with the guards' own daggers, which they will then plant on the sleeping men, smearing them with Duncan's blood. The castle bell tolls midnight. In the suffocating darkness, Macbeth makes his way to Duncan's chamber. The very air seems to thicken around him as he moves through the silent corridors. Before him appears a vision, a dagger floating. Two, in the air its handle turned toward him, leading him to Duncan's door. Blood appears to drip from its blade as Macbeth reaches for it, only to find his hand passing through empty air. Is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand? He whispers to the darkness. Come, let me clutch thee. But the vision remains intangible, a manifestation of his troubled mind, pointing the way to the king's chamber. The murder itself happens in terrible silence. Macbeth emerges from Duncan's room transformed, his hands red with royal blood. I have done the deed, he tells his waiting wife, but already his mind is fracturing under the weight of his crime. He thinks he heard a voice cry, Sleep no more, Macbeth does murder sleep. Lady Macbeth dismisses his fears, focusing instead on the practical matter of planting the bloody daggers on the guards. But Macbeth, paralysed by the horror of his act, has brought the daggers with him instead of leaving them as planned. When he refuses to return to the scene of his crime, Lady Macbeth snatches the daggers herself, declaring, The sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. She returns to Duncan's chamber to complete their deception, her hands too becoming stained with the king's blood. A knocking at the castle gate startles them both. Lady Macbeth hurries her husband to their chamber to wash the evidence from their hands and don their night clothes. But Macbeth is already lost in the magnitude of his deed. Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? No, this my hand will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine, making the green one red. The knocking continues, more insistent now. It is Macduff, Thane of Fife, arrived early to attend the king. In the grey light of dawn, he discovers Duncan's body and raises the alarm. The castle erupts in chaos. Bells toll, voices cry out, and nobles rush to the scene of the crime. Macbeth, playing his part, rushes to the king's chamber and kills the guards in a supposed rage, claiming their bloody appearance confirms their guilt. But Malcolm and Donalbane, the king's sons, are not convinced by this display. Sensing the danger around them, they flee, Malcolm to England and Donalbane to Ireland. Their flight serves Macbeth's purpose perfectly, casting suspicion on them for arranging their father's murder. With the princes gone and the throne vacant, Macbeth, as Duncan's closest kinsman present, is elected king. The witch's prophecy has come to pass, but at a terrible cost to Macbeth's peace of mind. Part 3. The Haunting. The crown rests uneasily on Macbeth's head, though he has achieved his. 3. Ambition. Peace eludes him. The prophecy concerning Banquo, that he will father a line of kings, torments Macbeth's thoughts. Each moment his former friend lives feels like a mockery of his own childless reign, a reminder that he has murdered sleep and peace of mind to win a barren crown. In the great hall of Dunsinane Castle, where Macbeth now holds his court, the new king broods upon his throne. The very air seems to thicken with his dark thoughts. To be thus is nothing but to be safely thus. His fear and suspicion of Banquo grow with each passing hour, fed by the memory of how clearly his friend saw through him on that fateful day of the witch's prophecy. 
Lady Macbeth, watching her husband's deterioration, attempts to calm his fears. What's done is done. But Macbeth cannot rest. In secret, he arranges for murderers to ambush Banquo and his young son, Fleance, as they ride at dusk. The killers are criminals with nothing left to lose, and Macbeth plays upon their hatred of Banquo, convincing them that their target is the source of all their misfortunes. As evening approaches, Banquo and Fleance depart the castle for a ride. The setting sun casts long shadows through the trees where the murderers wait. In the ensuing attack, Banquo is killed, but Fleance escapes into the darkness. When Macbeth learns of this partial success, his anxiety only increases. There the grown serpent lies. The worm that's fled hath nature that in time will venom breed. That night, Macbeth hosts a formal banquet for his nobles. Lady Macbeth presides as the gracious queen, while her husband attempts to play the role of benevolent monarch. But as Macbeth moves to take his seat at the table, he sees a terrifying sight. The bloody ghost of Banquo sits in his place, visible only to him. The king's reaction horrifies his guests. He speaks to empty air, his face contorted in terror. Thou canst not say I did it. Never shake thy gory locks at me. Lady Macbeth attempts to smooth over the scene, explaining to their guests that her husband has had such fits since youth. But Macbeth continues to rave at the ghost that only he can see. The banquet dissolves in confusion and whispered concerns about the king's stability. Once the guests have departed, Macbeth's paranoia reaches new heights. He resolves to visit the weird sisters again, to learn more of his fate. I am in blood stepped in so far that, should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as go o'er. In their cave the witches await him, stirring their cauldron with horrific ingredients. Eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog. When Macbeth arrives, they conjure apparitions that speak in riddles. They warn him to beware Macduff, yet tell him that none of woman born shall harm Macbeth, and four, that he will not be vanquished until great Burnham Wood to high Dunsinane Hill shall come. These seemingly impossible conditions for his defeat give Macbeth a false sense of security. Yet the final vision disturbs him deeply. A line of eight kings, all resembling Banquo, stretches to a mirror that shows many more to come. The witches vanish, leaving Macbeth with prophecies that will prove both true and tragically misleading. Learning that Macduff has fled to England, Macbeth orders the immediate execution of Macduff's entire family. This brutal act marks his final descent into tyranny. Lady Macbeth, meanwhile, begins to crack under the weight of their crimes. She walks the castle at night, trying to wash imaginary bloodstains from her hands. Out, damned spot, out, I say. The country groans under Macbeth's increasingly brutal rule. Noble after noble abandons him to join Malcolm and Macduff in England, where an army is gathering. Scotland, once described as a loving mother under Duncan, has become a grave for the living under Macbeth's reign of terror. Part 4. The Reckoning In England, Malcolm tests Macduff's loyalty by pretending to be an even worse potential king than Macbeth, claiming he would unleash all manner of vice and corruption upon Scotland. Macduff's genuine despair at this prospect proves his true devotion to his country. It is then that Ross arrives with devastating news. Macbeth has ordered the slaughter of Macduff's entire household, his wife, his children, and all his servants. Macduff's grief shakes the very foundations of his being. All my pretty ones, he cries. Did you say all? Oh, hell kite, all. What, all my pretty chickens and their dam at one fell swoop? Malcolm urges him to convert this sorrow into vengeful anger. Be this the whetstone of your sword. Let grief convert to anger. Blunt not the heart, enrage it. Meanwhile, in Dunsinane Castle, Macbeth's power seems to be crumbling from within. Lady Macbeth, once the steel in her husband's spine, now wanders the corridors at night, lost in memories of their crimes. 
Her gentlewoman and a doctor secretly observe these somnambulant confessions, watching in horror as she attempts to wash invisible blood from her hands. Yet here's a spot, out, damned spot, out, I say, she cries to the darkness. One, two, why then tis time to do it. Hell is murky. Who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? The doctor, witnessing her torment, declares, More needs she the divine than the physician. God, God, forgive us all. 5. Macbeth, receiving reports of his wife's condition, finds his own grip on reality weakening, yet he clings to the witch's prophecies, believing himself invincible. No man born of woman can harm him, and Burnham Wood cannot possibly come to Dunsinane. When news arrives that 10,000 English troops approach, led by Malcolm and Macduff, he responds with desperate bravado, Bring me no more reports. Let them fly all, till Burnham Wood remove to Dunsinane. I cannot taint with fear. But the seemingly impossible begins to occur. Malcolm's army, approaching Dunsinane, orders each soldier to cut a branch from Burnham Wood and carry it as camouflage. From the castle walls, a messenger reports this strange sight to Macbeth. The wood appears to be moving. The first prophecy is fulfilled, and Macbeth's confidence begins to crack. Then comes the news that Lady Macbeth is dead, having taken her own life. Macbeth receives this blow with a kind of hollow philosophy. She should have died hereafter. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. As Malcolm's army lays siege to Dunsinane, Macbeth still clings to the final prophecy, that no man born of woman can harm him. But even this false hope is stripped away when he finally faces Macduff in combat. I bear a charmed life, Macbeth boasts, only to have Macduff reveal that he was from his mother's womb untimely ripped born by Caesarian section, and thus not technically born of woman. In their final battle, Macduff prevails, decapitating Macbeth and fulfilling the witch's paradoxical prophecies. Malcolm is crowned the rightful King of Scotland, promising to restore order to the blood-soaked land. He declares his intention to rule with justice and grace, calling all his thanes to witness his coronation at Scone. The price of ambition lies heavy upon the stage. Macbeth and his lady dead, their legacy one of blood and madness. Banquo's son, Fleance, vanished but alive, carrying the seed of future kings, and Scotland itself, emerging from darkness into the promise of a new day. The witch's prophecies have all come true, but in ways no one could have foreseen, teaching a terrible lesson about the dangers of unchecked ambition and the corrupting nature of power. And so concludes the tragedy of Macbeth, a tale of prophecy and ambition, of murder and conscience, of supernatural temptation and very human weakness. The castle of Dunsinane still stands, its stones remembering the brief bloody reign of the man who would be king, and the price paid for a crown won through treachery and lost through destiny. The End <laughs>